بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا so before we start looking at the text again, what do, what do people think? Should we show the match here? Tomorrow is Argentina and Croatia, but Wednesday is Morocco and France, right? So maybe Morocco and France. Yeah. Right? No, yes. Yeah. yeah people sure. come? Yeah. Two o'clock, it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Yes. Yeah? We're here. Disclaimer, disclaimer what? <laughs> oh, yeah. And after that, though, like, you all think people, you will come to watch the match here if we do it at 2 in the afternoon? Yeah? Yeah, inshallah. You will? Your mom will let you miss school? <laughs> we can talk to her. She's right there. Yeah, I want to miss school. So you bring all your friends to watch school? Your friends are missing school to watch it? No. No? What time is school finished? Oh, yeah. My kids' school finishes at that time, too. Oh, maybe I'll bring them. Um, okay, we'll see. But not tomorrow. Like, does anybody really care what's happening with Argentina and Croatia? No? Messi fans, yeah. I hope Argentina loses. That's about it. Really? What? Wow. It's a tough crowd. Okay, we'll see. We'll figure it out, inshallah. Great. Um, so why don't we get started? Bismillah. Uh, people want to pull up the book. Um, it's the Book of Assistance. You can just Google Book of Assistance PDF, Imam al Haddad. And we're on chapter 3 um, that's translated as vigilance, but he's talking about a contemplative practice within our spiritual tradition called muraqaba. Um, essentially, you are looking over your heart, so your heart looks over you. Um, we've gone through probably half of this chapter. For those who it's your first time here, this text essentially is a text that provides a spiritual roadmap um, to its reader. Uh, and it presents this in steps, the really short, concise, easily digestible chapters. The first chapter was on yakin um, or certitude. It was like a deep faith, right? And so faith in and of itself is not just kind of abstract doctrine. Your conviction is not something that exists on a shelf somewhere. You can't believe something because somebody else believes it. Fundamentally, your belief lies within you. And when we talk about having deep faith in something, right, the way that we could come to this space and we know that there'll be chairs for us to sit in, we know that the lights will turn on, we know that the water will work in the wudu rooms, right, the same way you have faith that these things will essentially function, you believe in Allah the way that you believe the lights will turn on when you hit the switch, right? You believe in God the way that you believe that the water is going to come out of the faucet when you turn the faucet, right? Does that make sense? And so, yakin, certitude, Imam al-Haddad sets as the destination point, right? It's kind of the goal. And the idea is that that first chapter sets for us a common ground of what we're working towards because any individual reader will pick up a text and they won't have a shared beginning but you can have a shared kind of end in that worldly sense of spiritual acquisition. Right, then he sets in chapter two, Nia, intention, that you know why you're going to do what you're doing before you set out to do it, and that you constantly revisit this, right? It's a roadmap. You're kind of moving on a trajectory to get to a place, and so you revisit intention so that you can affirm for yourself, am I actually getting to where I want to get to? that did I turn where I was supposed to turn or did that turn take me away from what I had intended um, and then that third spot in this book that third chapter what we're looking at now is on muraqaba right vigilance of the heart you're engaged in this state of awareness wakefulness that your heart is literally like a soldier vigilant in terms of whatever you're gonna meet on this journey so what I want us to do to start off is, and maybe we can kind of like move in a little bit if people are comfortable with it. Um, but you can stay where you are also, whatever you want. But uh, just to make room so people come in to pray, they'll have space, they won't kind of clutter in the corners. Um, these are not meant to be chapters that are understood in isolation, right? Just like you don't want to look at Quran and Hadith 
in this kind of reductive approach of just looking at them in silos. That this one hadith means only this one thing. Or this verse of Qur'an only means this one thing. Because the idea is to be able to deepen relationship with text. The companions of the Prophet wasallam, all of them didn't memorize the whole Qur'an. And you had luminaries of our tradition who after the generation of the Sahaba came and they would say that Surah Al-Asr, for example, Imam Shafi says that if you were to just contemplate on that, that would be enough for you from the Qur'an. Right? The Surah Al-Ikhlas, the Hadith says, is a third of the Qur'an. Right? There's so much that we find within even the verses that we have regular interaction with. There's a reason why 17 times a day you recite Surah Fatiha and you're not mandated to recite Surah Al-Falaq or Surah Al-Nas. It's not that there's not benefit in these things, but the constant revisiting of them as you go through different phases of life so you can see how they're now applicable and draw more meaning from it and deepen in a relationship with it. So just on these three chapters that we've looked at so far, whether you were here for it or not, the first was on Yaqeen, like deep faith certitude as a destination point. The second was on intention, Niyya. The third is on Muraqaba, you know, this idea that you're mindful of what you're carrying with you, right? The luggage you come with, what you're giving a boat in your heart. I want you to turn to the people next to you and talk about what is the relationship between these three things. Right now, how we understand these things conceptually separately. Because for us, the challenge that many Muslims have today is not that it's hard to acquire information. You can literally go online right now and type in any word you want and add the word Islam to it and you'll get a ton of hits, articles, audio, video, podcasts that'll give you all kinds of information and then you can learn it in a silo. But you want to think about how concepts relate to one another, right? Don't just know that like this kind of job is haram or this kind of food is halal, but how does yakin relate to like your worldly sustenance? How does a faith in the divine or the state of your heart, muraqaba, relate to other things that you deal with in the course of going to school, going to work, dealing with family that's tough, dealing with friends that are not really so kind, or people that are great, right? How do we take concepts and apply them to where we are? As a starting point, it's also about how do they relate to each other. So why or how do these three topics have relevance to each other? Yaqeen, certitude, Niya, intention, muraqaba, vigilance, what are some of the connecting points to it? And you can add in the fourth, which we're going to get to today, the fourth chapter, is on the inner self and the outer self. It's a really short chapter, so we'll probably get through the whole thing. But how do these topics relate to one another in kind of a way that we can start to have a thread of interaction? Does that make sense? Right? Because like, it's easy to pray. You can go up and down. But sometimes the physical prayer becomes devoid of a prayer of the heart. Or it becomes devoid of like, who am I really praying to at the end of the day? But if you learn things separately from each other, right? You teach your kids to memorize Qur'an without giving them an insight of like, who sent down the Qur'an in the first place? And all of us have the children that we were still living in us. So many of us, if we were born into Islam, learned the words Fard and Haram before anybody taught us to celebrate God in our lives. Or you were taught to pray your sunnah prayers before you were taught whose sunnah you actually follow. In a meaningful way. Not just in terms of dates, of you know, names, of ancestors and these things. Not that those are not important things, but they're just regurgitated. Do you see what I mean? And it's how do these things all kind of connect to one another? And you start to think about it. So what's the connection between these chapters so far? Yaqeen, certitude, niya, intention, muraqaba, vigilance of the heart, the inner and outer self, which we'll get to. So if you could turn to the persons next to you, ideally in pairs, right? But try like no more than three so that everybody's getting to talk. And then we'll come back and discuss and then we'll get through the rest of the, the chapter. So go ahead. And if you don't know the names of the people around you, introduce yourself first. 
and then kind of start. And if somebody's sitting next to you, not talking to anybody, then just pull them into to your kind of group. <laughs>
Okay. So let's come back. So what are what are some of the things that kind of connect these different topics to each other? Right? And they could be all together, like individually. How does Yakin relate to Nia? How does Yakin relate to Morakaba? How does Morakaba relate to Nia? If in any ways, or all three. What did you discuss? What did you come up with? Okay. Who wants to start? Yeah. So, my mom, Morakaba is like. Hey, mom. I, I, was about, I was talking to my mom about it. Uh, Morakaba is like the purity of your heart, right? So, it's like, um, we were saying, like, the intention sort of comes from the purity of heart. And, like, you can sort of tell someone's, like, it's sort of vice versa. You can tell someone's intentions by their purity of heart, and you can tell how pure someone's heart is by, like, seeing what their intentions are. And then it also matched um, with the other one because they all go hand in hand with, like, like your heart and your intentions. Amazing. What do we think? Do we agree? Do you disagree? Or any other thoughts? Yeah. Well, there's, I think there's a little bit more. Like, as in... First, it, to, you want to, like certainty is the goal, right? So then we start with intention and vigilance. So at first you're gonna, it's like I think related to the book that you gave a couple weeks ago about like light and darkness in the heart. So at first when it's like all black, you know, you, you it's like another bad thing to you. And then once you become aware of it, you know, you kind of know it's probably bad, but like, you know, you don't feel it's bad, but you still act that it's bad anyway. And eventually you get work to the point where it starts to feel bad and you start filling it up with light. So then therefore, that's that's vigilance. You become more and more conscious of what Allah would think is good and what, what you would think is bad. And you begin to fix your intentions towards that and also their, you know, by proxy, your actions as well. Yeah, I must have that. Yeah, man. Yeah. I think that you have like an intention to like do something and then it connects with like the faith. Like you ha have the intention to turn on the light switch and you have faith that it's gonna like work I, I don't know yeah that's great you want to kind of flesh that out a little bit more i don't know how it was just like a thought in my head sorry do you understand what he's saying yeah how it, yeah what is he saying no, you're not gonna say <laughs> what do you it's an important thing do you understand like the fulfillment of the intention is still rooted in yakin like this is where reliance comes in Right? You're intending the act to turn on the switch with faith that like the lights will turn on. Do you understand? Right? And so if you kind of take that as a parallel to other things that you have going on beyond like an act that could be mundane, but something that says, why would I put myself out there in terms of greeting somebody that I don't know? Right? The hadith says, the best of you are those that greets those that they know and those that they don't. But you wrestle with those kind of core beliefs we talked about with intention and negative core beliefs. You know, maybe people don't like me, this or that. But the intention affirms itself in a concrete faith that you know if you do what's right, there's a divine promise that you have faith in that the fulfillment of that act might not necessarily be something that yields you what you were looking for here, but Allah's promise is true. Does that make sense? So there's like a, a sense of faith in the consequence of the act that's intended and the two go hand in hand. Is that what you were saying? Yeah, right? Amazing. And do you get, do you get why it's important? You know, because that's where the mindfulness aspect, the muraqaba comes in. That you're in a place where you just push out the clutter. You know, you push out the distractions and you kind of hone in on like, why am I doing what I'm doing? And what's really kind of the fundamental thing that I have a deep conviction in at the consequence of this, you know? So like, why am I going to not go to Juma? And when I'm intending the act of missing Juma, what is it telling me about like what I actually have conviction in? Do you see? Is that, you get what I mean? But when I intend it, and I know fundamentally that like my professor is gonna make a face at me 
you know, why did you ask for extended time on an exam or like blah, 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 or my boss is going to say, you know, do you really need to go do this every Friday at this time or whatever else? My intention is rooted in what I have yakin in, right? I have a Nia that affirms like what I actually have faith in at the end of the day. And you go back with vigilance to look and say, if I'm not doing it, what am I really putting my conviction in as a telling of myself? Do you, do you get what I mean? Does that make sense? Right? Yeah? What else? What else are con connections here? That was really good. Thank you. What else comes up? Somebody else had their hand raised. Any other connection points? Yes, no? Right now, a 10 year old and a 12 year old oh, yeah. are yeah. controlling the room. Oh, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Um, we also <laughs> talked about how like they're all interconnected and how the lack of one might result in the lack of the other. And then more specifically, how Mariama brought up is kind of like a, like a train, like you kind of have to have each in order to have like a complete spirit. Yeah. And the way certain things can compensate for each other, right? The pursuit is not a pursuit to perfection. That's not what Islam is about. You don't want to be in a place where you're paranoid that says everything always has to be right, always, all the time, and there won't be mistakes. Because sometimes taking a step backwards is advantageous because it gives you a different vantage point of what lies ahead. You know, and it allows for you to see things with a different kind of prism and a different sense of awareness and consciousness. Do you know what I mean? But these things can all bear impact on each other and their absence serves as a mode of impact as well as like their presence can so serve as a mode of enhancement, you know? So if I didn't have a terminology or like language around things, if I didn't know like what the word yakin was or no one ever said to me like live with kind of deep intentionality before, it wasn't a concept that I ever interjected into just my lexicon, then how can I do something with something that I don't even know is something that exists? Do you see? Because it's not like, oh, here's this thing that is a chair, and if I didn't like ever see it, if you never saw one of these things before, we constantly have people that email us, DM us on social media, what are these things that you're sitting on on the ground? I want them in my house. Right? They're called backjacks. If you want one, just Google backjack. That's what it is. It's a backjack. But if you didn't ever see a backjack before, you could somehow still figure out what it is. Right? And you could only use it in a few different ways. And fundamentally, you'd eventually figure out how to use it. This can be used in more than one way, by the way. Right? So the way you all are sitting on it is one way to do it. If you flip it the other way, you can actually lie down on it, which is pretty crazy to think about it. Yeah, go for it. Go nuts. You know? <laughs> and so when you're, when, you're, when you're with that, though, like you can still figure it out. You can't unconsciously figure out a concept like intention or a concept like yakin or a concept like muraqaba in that way. Do you see? And so this is where like part of it is about learning and knowledge, not in a place that you weaponize and you push people down by not quote unquote knowing, but the more you read, the more you expand your vocabulary, the more you hear other people's ideas and opinions and thoughts can create an opportunity now to broaden and think about how does this resonate with me in different ways. Do you get what I'm saying? Like I was in Singapore and I've been invited to speak at something by a organization that works with the government there, it's called Muiz, and they essentially oversee every masjid and every madrasa, and they were going through like a kind of plenary session of what the next 10 years was going to look like. So you're talking about like hundreds and thousands of teachers and imams and others, and there was people that came up to me afterwards who they were talking to me about things like depression, anxiety, self-harm, abuse, and they said, we don't know what to do because they don't talk about this here. And they said, we look westward to people from your country where 
religious scholars are talking about things like substance abuse. They are talking about things like that we struggle with, mental health, emotional wellness, etc. But some of them said to me, we didn't even know that these were things until we started to hear people talk about them. Do you understand? And your religious growth cannot be something that starts and ends with a Sunday school kind of trivia knowledge of Islam. At every level and every juncture of your growth, there is a need to be able to revisit, renew, as well as acquire new information and understanding for your own peace of mind and inward stability so that you can start putting names to things that you have felt but didn't know how to validate. And the same way that goes to like your emotional self, your spiritual self needs to be in a place where it has access to language and practice and other things that it's yearning for, but you can't just somehow organically develop those ideas on your own. Do you, you see what I mean? And that's like what the Quran is there for. So if you don't read it, you're not going to be able to take from it what it says. Right? That's what the Sunnah is there for. It's not so you can walk into a room and be like, Oh my God, you're dressed like this and you listen to that and how could you eat this and why would you talk to this person? There's nowhere in the Hadith where the Prophet does that to people. When he literally just walks into a mass gathering and starts sizing up how everybody is living in contradiction to his way of life. Right? The Ihsan the Prophet has because he lives all these concepts Render now for him a prism and perspective of worldview that sees what's inherently good in others, empowers them through that. He doesn't need to fill himself up in a way that elevates himself by denigrating others. And then he leaves behind this example so that you have access to these things. Because in a chaotic world like this, it's not that much different from what the Meccan society was that these people were living in also. They had a lot of the same challenges, a lot of the same issues, right? But then when you're 20, you're 30, you're 40, you're 50, you have marriages not working out, family doesn't let you do certain things, jobs don't work out, there's other stresses. You can't then just go back to when you were nine years old and someone had you memorize a list of names that you never learned like what to do anything with. How does this apply back to my life? Do you see what I mean? Does that make sense? And how do these things relate to each other, right? Does that make sense? So as we continue to go through these texts, we want to look at how the different concepts relate to each other. And on your own, you sit for like 10 minutes and you say, how does this manifest in my life? And how do the different aspects of it relate to other things, right? You don't know so much Quran, that's okay, right? The parts that you know. How do you go and read Surah Fatiha and have it be something that you look at through the prism of Yaqeen, of Nia, of Muraqaba? You see what I mean? Right? You go read Surah Ikhlas. How does that apply to some of these concepts? And it deepens now with what you have and you can look at it through a different prism and it gives more beauty like in that perspective. Does that make sense? Are you sure? Yeah, can somebody who's nodding tell me what I'm saying so that I actually know that you're not just nodding to get me to shut up? You're nodding really hard, what am I saying? <laughs> like to not think about where my stand, spiritual standing is when it comes to Muraqaba or Nia, rather to try to implement all of these with what knowledge I have right now and to keep proceeding with what I have. Yeah, what else? Anything else come to mind? Yeah. So, like, don't focus on those very, I would say, you know, what you think to be the standard indicators of practicing faith, like just pure memorization, pure, like, uh, uh, rituals, but, like, think holistically, think, like, not, we, what were we saying? We were saying um, not just self-reflection, but spiritual reflection of, like, about how all these things interconnect and, like, think about, like, don't get focused on the tree, but think about the forest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amazing. Wow, it always feels nice when people are listening to you. <laughs> also felt good that you remembered something from Jemma from weeks ago. Because when you said that, I was like, what did I say? <laughs> I remember about that. Alhamdulillah. Okay, why don't we go to the book. Um, and so we're 
at chapter 3, we were looking at um, the chapter on vigilance, and we had read the first couple of paragraphs, uh, but why don't we just start from the beginning again, because it's pretty short, just so we can kind of recap some of it, and then we'll get to the middle of the um, second page and kind of talk it out a little bit. Somebody want to start from the beginning, you must, oh my brothers. You want to read? Yeah, okay. Go for it. You must, O oh my brothers, be mindful of God in all your movements and times of stillness. At every moment, with every blink of the eye, with every thought, wish, or any other state, feel his nearness to you. Know that he looks and is aware of you, that nothing that you conceal is hidden from him. Nothing that weighs so much as an atom is hidden from your Lord, whether on earth or in heaven. When you speak aloud, he knows your secret thought and that which is even more hidden. He is with you wherever you are with his knowledge, awareness, and power. If you are of the righteous, he will guide, assist, and protect you. What? Yeah, you keep going. Have modesty before your Lord as you should. Make sure that he never sees you in a situation which he has forbidden you and never misses you where he has commanded you to be. Worship him as if you saw him, for even if you do not see him, he sees you. Whenever you notice in your soul any laziness in his worship or inclination to disobedience, remind it that God hears and sees you and knows your secrets and secret conversation. Okay, so just a quick recap, right? The first paragraph we talked about last time is giving us like a frame of benefit in terms of this awareness that Murakaba is going to yield for us, right? It's not just that you're walking on eggshells, that I'm thinking about a God that's simply watching me, but a God that's watching over me. You know, I feel the presence of the divine. I recognize Allah's rahmah, His mercy. I recognize His mawadda, His love, right? I le recognize in a way that gives me hope and gives me strength. And then the second paragraph talks about haya you know, not in the way that quite simplistically we also understand it, just in terms of like clothing and dress, but haya in the sense of like a modesty, it's defined in its most technical way here, that God does not see you absent from a gathering that he would want you to be in, nor does he see you present in places that he would not want you to be in, right? This is the definition of modesty within an Islamic spiritual definition of it. Right? It's not just about like the clothes that you wear, but it's about literally this idea that you have haya, like a certain shyness that's rooted in that definition. That you are present where Allah wants you to be and you are absent from where He would not want you to be. That God does not see you where He would not want you to be seen, nor does He see you absent from the places that He would want you to be seen. And now, this is where we had ended last time. We went through this whole set of just like specific ways that you can gauge like your state of vigilance, right? Imam al-Haddad gives this like list now of specific things that you can start to do to help kind of navigate some of this. Do you want to continue? Yes. Um, where... Whenever you notice yes. in your soul. Whenever you notice in your soul any laziness in his worship or inclination to disobedience, Remind it that God hears and sees you and knows your secrets and secret conversation. If this reminding does not benefit it because of the inadequacy of its knowledge of the majesty of God, remind it of the two noble angels who record good and evil deeds and recite to it. When the two receivers receive, sitting on the right and on the left, he utters no word, but there is with him a watcher ready. If this reminding does not influence it, remind it of the proximity of death, that it is the nearest of all hidden and awaited things. Frighten it of its sudden pouncing, whereby if it does come when it is an, in an unsatisfactory, um, in an unsatisfactory state, it will end up in endless perdition. If this threat is of no use, remind it of the immense reward which God has promised those who obey him and the painful torment with which he has threatened those who disobey him. 
Say to it, O soul, after death there will be no opportunity to repent, and there will be, after this life, only the garden or the fire. Choose, if you will, obedience, the consequence of which is triumph, contentment, immortality in vast gardens, and looking at the face of God, the generous, the beneficent, or else disobedience, the consequence of which is degradation, humiliation, mockery, deprivation, and imprisonment between layers of fire. Endeavor to cure your soul with such reminders when it neglects obedience and inclines to rebellion, for they are useful medicines for the heart's diseases. So what is the point of all of these things? Like, what's the end result supposed to be doing in this prism of muraqaba? Do you understand the question? What, what's it trying to do? Why are you doing these things? The angels, death, reward. Like, why are you reminding yourself of these things? Yeah. Cure your soul. Okay. But, like, what is it supposed to then yield for you? How does this relate to muraqaba? Yeah, but how does this help you create mindfulness? What's it trying to get to get done? Yeah. It's in a way like transitioning, I guess, like for lack of a better way to put it, like your moral compass towards closer aligned with Allah, I guess, maybe. And okay. So therefore, you sort of begin to now become much more conscious of your actions. Yeah. It's, so the idea is like your heart is not awake. And you're telling it stuff now to wake it up. You know what I mean? You're in this place where the laziness that we talk about here, this is a prophetic dua. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-ajzi wal qasal. The Prophet used to make dua that, oh Allah, I seek refuge with you from ajaz, which is incapacity, we can talk about it a little bit, and qasal, laziness, right? So laziness is like you have the capacity to do something, but you just don't do it, right? You're kind of putting it off, yeah. Um, I sort of wanted to compare this because like this morning, so like I do like wrestling with my school and we have to get up early at like 7 a.m. Sundays for practices and last night I had to sleep sort of late because like my aunt is staying at our house for a little bit and like so I slept later last night and I had to get up really early this morning and I really don't want to get out of bed and my dad told me like discipline and he kept like reminding me and reminding me and then I finally got up and then I ended up being a little bit late but it still ended up well and I think it's sort of like compared to like reminding you're like your heart to like stay on the right path and like be vigilant and like have good discipline. Yeah. And understanding this, right? Like you play football, right? I used to play football. He's like the same size as I am now. So you can tell why I don't play football anymore. But in understanding that so much of that game is like a mental strength game, you know? And when you're five foot small and you're playing with guys that went to play D1 and they're huge, and much stronger and faster and everything else, your ability to stay focused in that requires you to have a self-talk that says that my mind is going to be as alert as possible. And this does not tell you any of these things in the prism of like you are a horrible person if you suddenly lose awareness and wakefulness for a few minutes, right? That it's okay to be exhausted, it's okay to be tired that sometimes you're going to feel like you don't have energy. You're going to feel as if, like, what's the point? But you catch yourself from automatic thoughts and default setting thoughts by then bringing consciousness back in. And what Imam al-Haddad is saying, because the reader of this text is reading through a prism of spirituality, right? He does what he does. This is what his, like, living is, so to speak. So the assumption is the reader of this is coming to him also looking for spiritual prescription. The same way you go to your doctor when you got a problem, the doctor is going to assume the medical advice that you give is going to be what you take seriously or not, right? So here, like he's giving you spiritual prescription. You have to translate this now in a way that if these are not words you have familiarity with, if you don't have a consciousness or care at the fact that there's angels on your shoulders writing things down, you could go and look up social experiments that are done where people are literally put in rooms 
by themselves and they're told. There are cameras recording you. And they know that people are watching what is happening, but they're all alone. And after a short period of time, they just start doing the dumbest things. <laughs> Could care less about anything else. That They're literally told. There's cameras that are recording you and watching you. And after like however much time passes, they start doing things that you'd be like, how could you do that knowing somebody is watching you? You ask that question not rhetorically, but you ask that question in a way that yields then a result. And you start to then think to yourself, the way Imam al-Haddad is giving you now a set of kind of responses that, hey, laziness comes in in this specific way that you're going to tell yourself, I don't need to pray my sunnahs. Somebody else is going to vacuum. Somebody else will serve the food. Somebody else is going to put the chairs away, right? These are just like nafsani thoughts. We're not talking about shaitani haram thoughts. We're talking about things that are just keeping you from doing what's recommended. Things that you do for your benefit. But when the laziness sets in, Imam al-Haddad says, this is how you reclaim control of your thoughts. You sit down and you take a breath and then you realize that you are in control of you. Your thoughts are not in control of you. So here's the handful of things that in specific you could say. If this first thing doesn't work, say this next thing. If that doesn't work, then say this next thing. Try telling yourself that if you don't do this, there is a world after this that incorporates that which is a pit of chastisement. May Allah protect us from it. If that doesn't go, then try to compel yourself with something positive. Tell yourself that even here, there's like Jannah in store for people who do these kinds of things, right? But you figure for yourself too, in this language, what's going to get you to be in a place that has the ability to get your heart back in a state where it's on top and it's awake. So you're not lost in a place where you're like playing games with people's lives, you know, you're leading people on in relationships, you're unkind to your friends and your family, you're in a place where you allow for kind of mistreatment and abuses to exist, right? It doesn't make any sense. Like fundamentally, if you're in this place where the default settings, and it doesn't even have to be in things that are like that. Have you ever sat down and then at the end of something, right? Like I went to Toronto uh, to speak at something with uh, Khabib, the UFC like fighter. Some of you might've seen it online. Really nice man, mashallah. And I went in a day early uh, so that in case the snow was bad or anything that there wouldn't be any cancellations so a friend of mine went and I met up with another friend of mine who I used to live with and another brother who's a friend of mine there's four of us and before I left I had uh, brunch here with my daughter and my son at Lipton I think some of you, I think we had brunch with us that day and a couple of other people too um, and it was great, and it's all you can eat. We have like the only halal certified dining hall in the country. Um, there's 1,600 menu items that circulate through it. It's really good. If anybody ever wants to go, let me know. I have also 50 meal swipes that have to be used by the end of this month. So if anybody wants to go, it's on me. But I can only do six in like a meal setting. So, you know, uh, let's get rid of those so they don't go to waste. So I ate that, and we ate a lot of food in the sense that I ate my food and then my kids do this thing where when they don't finish something they just bring their plate to me thinking that I'm going to eat it and then I just kind of eat it what can I do right and then I ate that and then usually on the plane I fall asleep and a friend of mine was on the plane with me and so we didn't you know sleep and um, my flyer status usually gets me upgraded pretty nice alhamdulillah so these people are bringing us food and so I'm eating like this stuff on this Delta flight, things I just normally don't do. And then we landed and then we went to eat dinner at a steakhouse in Toronto that was really amazing. And the guy who owned the steakhouse was very kind 
and he had met me at a conference before. He just kept bringing food out to us. And then after that, we went to a dessert place in Toronto that's called the D-Spot, if any of you have been to it. It was also amazing. I ate something that after I ate it, I got up and I looked at the table behind me and there was six people eating all together the thing I just eaten alone. <laughs> By the time I got to my hotel, it's now one in the morning and I like felt so crazy. And then I'm trying to sleep and at three in the morning, one of my friends that was with me, he's like texting me and he's like, I can't sleep, man. I'm like sweating because we ate so much food. <laughs> Why would we do that? And was it like wakefulness that was determining what we were going to be eating at that time? And in that moment, it's just after the fact, I'm like, why would I do this to myself? Why would I do this to myself? I'm going to be on a stage tomorrow with a man who's like a machine. <laughs> like, I can't, I literally can't like move without breaking my wudu right now. It's crazy. Man. You know? Yeah, go ahead. Was Habib nice? He was really nice. Yeah, we're trying to get him to come to New York and so on. So, make do how it works. Um, but, do you get what I'm saying? Right? Like, after the fact, there's still an opportunity for wakefulness to come in. And then you come back and you're like, I'm not going to ever do that nonsense ever again. You know? And you sometimes learn through being in a place where the default sets in, but at any given point in time in that mess, I could have been in a place where I was like, I think this is good. Like, I don't need to do this anymore, you know? And this is like the whole point of it. You start to engage in a self-talk that utilizes reminders that says like, hey, there's somebody else on the other end of that app that you're swiping on. That there's somebody else that you're kind of leaving behind when you gossip, where your own heart is being put in a place where you're not making decisions through it, but rather at its expense. How do you inculcate now wakefulness? How do you get to a place where you break out of the default settings? You're not supposed to live the way everybody else does. You live differently because you're Muslim and that's fine. The yield at the end is gonna be something that is a great gain in this world and in the next, because in this world it creates a peace of mind. It doesn't create just a facade of contentment, it's actual contentment, that you're able to manage things a little bit differently, right? I want you to think now for yourself, just with yourself, if you have something where you can write, that's great. What are things that you do that you can say to yourself? You're all alone, and this is where Ihsan comes in, in this prism of Muraqaba. God sees you wherever you are. So not just like I'm with my friends, we're also very stupidly forgetting that we're 40 years old and we're eating all of this stuff that we shouldn't, right? And not any one of us is like reminding ourselves in this Muslim version of drunk driving that we're engaging in, <laughs> that like somebody has to be the sober human being, you know? That's a different scenario. When you're alone at home and there's nobody else there other than you with you, and you are there now with your nafs, you are there now with your stomach, you are there now with your heart, you are there now with the akal, the intellect, and you will determine which is going to drive decision. What are things that you can say to yourself to get your heart to be sovereign? I want you to think just for a minute, because there's not any moment where some of us don't feel that laziness set in, or we fall into habits that we know we're not proud of, right? Or we do things that are just like pointless. Right? Where do we kind of get to a place? The way Imam al-Haddad is saying, here's some things you could say to yourself. It's not that you're a bad person if saying this to yourself doesn't make sense. Because if you don't talk to yourself like this already, then it's not going to necessarily work in the onset. You can get to that place. But what are the things that you can say to you that are going to get your heart to be in a place where it's making the decision? It's awake. Do you get what I mean? Just take a minute and think within yourself, what are some of those things that would allow for me? If you want to write it to yourself, great. So that you have that accountability and you're reflecting in it. You can pull out a phone and write. What are like two or three things that'll help me snap back into a place?
And as you're thinking about that, I want you to think about it now. How do you do that in other situations where there are other people around you, right? And what are the times like the default comes in? You're arguing with somebody, for example, right? A parent that you don't get along with so well. And these are barring situations of abuse, right? May Allah protect us from it and protect us from ever being one who spread it or cause that kind of harm to people. You know, but argumentation arises, right? Emotions escalate, things come up, right? Bilal radiallahu an and Abu Dhar radiallahu an, they're arguing back and forth and back and forth until the emotions escalate to a place and Abu Dhar calls Bilal the son of a black woman in a derogatory way. And Abu Dhar himself, he's known as being a black Arab. So essentially what he's calling Bilal is like the son of an African in a way that is derogatory. And when they both hear it, then they become conscious of what it is, right? And then they start going back and forth in a way to try to remedy the situation. That Abu Dhar says to Bilal, like, put your foot on my face, you know? When the Prophet hears that this happens, he gets angry. Because the Prophet doesn't get angry at a lot of haram things. He walks with people through their struggles. But when people are racist, people are abusive, the anger is apparent. In the other instances, there's compassion, there's gentleness, there's kindness. He's walking with them through their struggles. But here now, the emotions escalate. You're fighting with somebody, how do you get your heart to be what's in charge? You're in a place where the emotions are high. How do you get the heart to be in a place of wakefulness again? And usually these are things that happen in private settings, not in secret settings. Secret worship is when it's just you and only you. Your private sphere is different from your public sphere because this is public. Your private sphere is what you're doing in your house with your friends, your family, your roommates. Those are normally the people that we unleash like the worst out on, right? May Allah make it easy for us. How do you reclaim control of your heart in that moment? What are you going to say to yourself? Not about controlling the other person because you have literally no control over them. So what will allow in that moment, right? Imam al-Haddad is giving you some examples of things. When it comes to obedience and worship of Allah, it's not just about, did you pray Fajr in its time, which is a thing, but it's also about, like, what is the interactions, the etiquettes, the adab with the people around you, you see? And then the last frame you want to think about it in is in that public setting now. That there are people around you, but what helps you to give, like, the heart control? that will snap it back into a place where it's the element of you that is the one that is kind of defining and dictating how you're engaging things around you. And you gotta come up with like a recipe, you know, that's gonna allow for you to breathe again and to be in a place where you're not just running on default and all the emotional garbage that you've been through in your life now suddenly triggers itself and it unloads in a place. I was having an argument once with a friend of mine, or like a semi-argument, where they were just like, kind of going on and on and on. And, you know, I was exhausted, running on empty, my head was hurting. And then I said to him, like, hey man, can you just stop talking? And then I called him somebody else's name. And he was like so into what he was saying, he wasn't listening anyway. But I caught myself calling him somebody else's name and I said, what's going on here? And that circumstance was taking me back to a place of remembrance that was embedded in a friendship that I had some years ago that was not like a healthy friendship when I was younger and involved a lot of just difficult kind of interactions and a lot of like just really kind of deep anger and all kinds of things. And years later, this guy is engaging me at a moment where there's other parts of me that are responding similarly, and I literally call him by somebody else's name. You see? And that doesn't mean I'm a bad person, but I'm in a place where I have to have self-awareness that can allow for me to then kind of heal from what I need to heal from, and then still determine what's going to be the variable that defines my interactions with each other. How do I snap back to a place of wakefulness? 
how do I let that vigilance come in? Do you see what I mean? Does that make sense? Can we read the next paragraph? If you find emerging in your heart, Anybody want to read? Yeah, go ahead. If you find emerging in your heart, when you call to mind the fact that God observes you, a shyness that prevents you from disobeying Him, and drives you to exert yourself in obeying Him, you are in possession of something of the realities of vigilance, Muraqaba. Great. So, this is where you catch yourself, right? Obedience and disobedience are also languages that we don't necessarily use so much other than when we're now retreating to like a childlike state and we think about punishment from parental figures or things to that extent. This is going to be healthy based off of who you conceptualize God to be. And if you're in a place where you've never thought about who is Allah to me, then you got to start thinking about that now. And what these texts and other texts and the Quran itself tells us is to know Allah through how He tells you who He is. Not through a supremacist society that's deeply laden now in privileged demographics that incorporate a white male Protestant kind of mindset that unconsciously has you believe not in a grammatically masculine God, but in a very gendered male God, that then also you believe is an angry God, because growing up, everybody always told you why what you did was haram, or that when you actually did haram things, you didn't really know how to deal with it, and you felt guilty, and it made you hurt inside, and you had to hide things, or that when they were found out, then you also were just embarrassed, because people would tell you here's all the things wrong with you as opposed to ever telling you what was right with you or you got to the member and the khatib is talking to you about all these things you go to sunday school and everything is haram or even if it's not it's still just all legalistic it's only in one prism of like externals and do's and don'ts and all the other facets that are critical to this spiritual tradition and this faith that we practice they start to be left out of the conversation and then they don't become means of healing. If you read the Quran, the Prophet Ibrahim salam, for example is in conversation with his community and he's asking them, like, why do you worship these things that you worship? And what quite often gets kind of given as an insight that seems to be like one that's putting down those that worship in their way. You can read it also as the Prophet Ibrahim telling you that he knows who his God is, and these people have no idea who their God is. And he says, my God feeds me and gives me drink. My God heals me whenever I'm sick. He knows fundamentally who his God is. And then when he snaps into this state of muraqaba, he is wakeful of that God watching over him. Not just a God that's watching him as if Allah is looking for a reason to punish you, but a God that's watching over you, looking for a reason to let you know you are never alone. So even when you're making those mistakes, when you're by yourself, when you screw up, you hurt people, you're doing things to hurt yourself, that are just giving you complacency at the expense of contentment, Allah is still there with you. And all you got to do is turn back to God and know that there's always room to turn back to God. But it's not going to work if you don't know who God is to you or if you can't deconstruct a conceptualization of God that has been built up within you. Might not be on your own volition, but based off of your socialization. Parents, elders, the masjid, Muslims, different people, society, whiteness, patriarchy, capitalism, all of these things shape for you understandings, consciously or unconsciously. And if you have never focused, sat down to think out who is Allah to me, 
It doesn't mean that you haven't fallen into a paradox of choice that when you have not consciously chosen, you have still then made a choice. And there is an unconscious perspective you have of God. Do you understand? Does that make sense? What I would recommend, and it's very important, you're going to, all of you, have days off in the coming weeks. There's entire days that everything is just shut down. And you sit down during the course of that and you think to yourself, like, who do I actually believe God to be? You take out a notebook and say, who is God to me? And you write down the answer. And then you go open the Quran, you open the Hadith, you read like chapters that speak about who Allah is. He literally introduces himself to you right in the beginning. The Basmalah, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. This is who he's telling you, who he is, right? It's just all there. Ar Rahman Rahim, Maliki Yomidin. He's giving you insight, right? How does what he tells you he is match up with who you believe? And it's not an exam. It's you sitting with yourself, so you make yourself vulnerable. And you write down, what do I believe God to be? And how does that relate to who he says that he is? Azawjal. You see? And then where am I going to create a connection to get me from one point to the next? Right? So then now when that wakefulness is coming in, it's not just mindfulness in the sense that I know there's a chair here, but it's mindfulness rooted in an ethical imperative that has taqwa to it, a consciousness of Allah. So it breaks down moral relativism because fundamentally this religion isn't about what I think is good or what you think is good. It's about what Allah knows to be good. And knowing what Allah knows to be good yields also for its practitioner, the practitioner yields to the idea that that's what's best for me. But none of it makes sense if you don't know or think about who God is to you. It's a God-centric religion. How can you not think about who God is in the midst of this, right? And I could tell you, you want to like way to think about this, whether you are a convert or born into Islam, if somebody converted here tomorrow and you sat down, you want a different way to do the exercise? You write, instead of the prompt of who is Allah to me, write down, if a convert came to ask me to teach them Islam, what would I tell them? Because I could put you in front of like hundreds of people that have taken their shahada, that I've sat with, and after they convert, it stops being about God. And they're in a place where what keeps them from becoming Muslim are like specifics that are rooted more in culturally hegemonic attitude towards religion or like particular things that have really nothing to do with the beauty of our religion fundamentally. But as an exercise, I want you to think about it, right? If somebody came and converted to this beautiful religion and they sat down with you and they said, teach me what Islam is, what would you teach them? Because you can't give somebody something that you don't have to begin with. Would you give them anxiety around religion? Would you tell them that it's okay for you to miss these rituals and obligations? Would you tell them, like, don't have a dog? Go buy a lota. Like, only at this. Is that like what religion is as a starting point? Right? But I can't tell you the number of converts that I've sat with in just the last month. Not even how many years. In the last month where these are the first questions that they ask. Because some Muslims someplace, that's what they've given to them. And you can get frustrated with the people that that's what they've given to them, but you can also then think, when you're in a space of community and there's love and compassion, to me it's like, man, what do the people in the community I serve think this religion is actually about? And who taught them this deen? That they are now in a place where they can give somebody something and this is what they have to give? Do you see what I'm saying? 
And then when you're in this place where you're choosing between wakefulness and unwakefulness, unwakefulness is going to always feel better. Because why would you want to then believe in a God that doesn't believe in you? Why would you want to have an awareness of a God that you think is looking for a reason to push you down? Do you see what I mean? And that unlearning becomes really important. I'm going to say one last piece on this and then we'll read the rest of the chapter and then we'll probably wrap up. Uh, you got to be smart about how you talk to other people as well. Because religion is like a very difficult thing for many people. And the need to be able to understand ethics and etiquette, adab, good character, and why that's important is because it sets a standard for so many in terms of how they can then relate to faith. So you're all good people, mashallah, right? And you don't have to see yourself in a certain way for it to be true. So you overcome what's inside and then you think about like how you can extend compassion and love and mercy and then it creates residual benefit. Then one of the ways the heart becomes soft and it becomes tender and awake is through engaged acts of generosity and kindness. But you have to create some of those opportunities for yourself. How can you give salams to people who come into the prayer room and no one talks to them if you're not in the prayer room yourself to begin with? How can you be the person that volunteers at iftar if you're not there to begin with? Do you see what I mean? And you start to bring that wakefulness to decisions that plan out the day, that plan out the week. That isn't a quantified aspect. This is not a religion that is about how much you do. It's about how you do the things that you do. And you do them with ihsan. You do them with the heart, not at the heart's expense. You do them with inner self like kind of awareness do you see but because everything comes back to god in our religion if you don't know what you're talking about then don't say anything you understand because you don't want to stand in front of allah on the day of judgment and it's one thing if allah says to somebody why don't you believe in god but it's going to be another thing when Allah says to you, why were you the reason that this person didn't believe in me? Like, why were you talking on my behalf if you didn't know what you were saying? We have prophets that are sent to us. 124,000 are theology posits. Of them, there's like 300, 315 that were messengers come with a book. 25 are named in the Qur'an. Five of those are deemed to be the five best of the prophets. And they are there because they remove now the theoretical. They're exemplars, they're role models, but they move out like what is subjective to what is concrete. You can't understand the Qur'an without the seerah, and if you try to, this is where you create all kinds of foolish notions that somehow validate and justify mistreatment of others. And so over the course of the holidays, just sit down, and you're in a place where it's okay to rest, it's okay to breathe, even if the world tells you you have to constantly going and moving and doing. No, you don't. Like, you just simply, you don't. It's okay for you to take some time just even 5, 10, 20 minutes in a day that you're just able to rest and disconnect from everything. You think about who is Allah to you? Who do you believe God to be? You take some time. You talk to each other. You reach out. You don't have resources? Tell me. I'll send you some stuff you can read and look at. What does Islam say? Who is Allah? What does the Quran say? What does the Hadith say? And then you compare the two. You think, where does the disconnect come in, if anything? When you can get to a place where you have that concrete belief, a yakin in a God that believes in you and wants just what's best for you, then you're going to want to be like in a state of wakefulness, not in a state where you're like kind of walking around slumbering. You see what I mean? Okay, let's read this last paragraph here. Who wants to read it? 
Go ahead. Know that vigilance is one of the most noble stations, high positions, and lofty degrees. It is a station of excellence, Ihsan, indicated in the Prophet sayings, saying, Excellence is to worship God as if you saw Him, for if you do not see Him, He sees you. Each believer has faith that nothing on earth or in, or in heaven is concealed from God, that God is with him wherever he is, and that none of his movements or times of stillness are concealed from him. But the important thing is that this awareness be permanent and that its results appear, the least of which is that he does nothing when alone with God, that he would be ashamed of should a man of virtue see him. This is rare, and it eventually leads to that which is rarer still, whereby the servant is totally immersed in God, annihilated in Him, and thus rendered unaware of all else, absent from creation through his contemplation of the true King, having arrived at a secure seat in the presence of an able sovereign. So, so like, how are you? Uh, it's a it's a lofty station it's not easy right meaning like it's something you aspire towards right you got to have self-love and self-forgiveness and this stems from recognizing again like who is a law you're gonna make mistakes I'm gonna make mistakes but in that it still is not about kind of the act in and of itself what shaitan wants is not for you to commit the misdeed. He wants you to believe that the misdeed is enough for you to no longer have a relationship with Allah, right? Everything comes back to Allah. Everything comes back to like damaging that relationship with Allah. Then being in a place where you can find for yourself, why is this a priority? And it creates a different vision as I go into the workforce, as I go and meet the day ahead of me, as I deal with things that I love and things that I detest and things that are struggles and things that are easy and all of these things. And fundamentally, like what is this all about at the end of all of it? And that I wasn't put here to just be a body, right? I wasn't put here in a place where I was given the capacities that I'm given, right? What other parts of creation have the ability to just think the way you can think? What other parts of creation have the ability to remember things? And not even remember what you've lived. Literally. You cannot go to the birds and they can tell you what it was like to be a bird 5,000 years ago. Right? You can't be in a place where you go and you sit and a pack of dogs can tell you what life is going to be like for dogs like 200 years down the line. Humanity not only has the ability to think about where it's at in this moment, but it has the capacity to understand through historical reference where it was centuries ago and can even project where things will be like decades, if not centuries down the line. That's crazy that you don't utilize your thought functionality to its best capacity then. That it's only in the moment and only conscience at the limited amount of time that the mind engages. 4% of your thoughts are done consciously in comparison to 96% that are just repeat, automated, like going on default settings. Now wakefulness is like, no, you use your entirety of your heart and you use your entirety of your brain. I was walking down the street today and I was just thinking to myself. And literally, I was thinking to myself, where the thoughts come when I'm thinking them. And I don't know if this sounds like it's crazy, but I don't mind, right? And I'm trying to think in my body, as I'm thinking my thoughts, they're not necessarily projecting to me through like my feet or my knees or my stomach, but literally I can hear my thoughts in my upper self of my being. And that consciousness that exists within me, that's attached to the soul that is also inherently within me, that makes me distinct from the rest of creation, requires sometimes thinking the placement of these things, as well as the awareness of them, and becoming acquainted with them in different ways. And so, being in a place where you are wakeful and alert is not an easy thing, Imam al-Haddad is saying. When it says it's a lofty station and it's giving that indication, 
you like you work towards it. Some days are going to be tough. Other days are going to be great. Ramadan is not going to feel like outside of Ramadan. You're sitting in Medina and Mecca. It's going to be very different than when you're sitting in the middle of Manhattan. You're in different places and you yield now different potentials and different capacities. But you're in a space where you still have a desire, a longing to create for yourself a connection to what makes you inherently human. You see? And that vigilance, that wakefulness is something that's critical. I want you to take two minutes now and just turn to the persons next to you again. What are some of the things you're taking away from this conversation? Things that stick out with you? And then we'll come back and discuss and we'll wrap up for the night. So if you just turn to people, what are some of the takeaways?
So, what are some of the things we're taking away from today? What are things that you're taking away from today's conversation? Yeah. Yeah, in Surah Al-Furqan, there's a verse, وَإِبَادُ الرَّحْمَانِ الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ يَخَوْنَا That the Ibad rahman the servants of the merciful, they're the ones who walk on the earth with dignity and grace. وَإِذَا خَاطَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامًا And when those who are ignorant, right, and the Ida is like indicating it's going to happen, right? Then when the ignorant like speak to them, they respond with salam. Right, they respond with peace, but it doesn't mean you have to put up with people's nonsense. Right, you just kind of maintain composure at the end of the day. Do you know? What else? What are things we take away from today? Anything? Yeah. I um, mean, one of the things I was reflecting on, as as you're talking about wakefulness and mindfulness, was uh, you know, sometimes we have this idea of like what wakefulness is or what it would look like, like you know, like a lofty station and everything, and. I think when you mention, and you keep mentioning, and you, you mentioned this a lot, it's like, you know, just be in the moment, and sometimes wakefulness starts here. So it was something as simple as, um, like, saying salam to, like, people in this room, like, being present with them, right? Acknowledging their presence. So that's something the Prophet Salaam always to do. Um, so, I mean, just something like, I was like, you know, like, wakefulness doesn't have to be, like, it doesn't necessarily mean, like, you're necessarily, like, asleep, that you need to be waking up, but it's more like, well, how can I just, uh, amplify my consciousness in this moment. Uh, so it doesn't mean like I'm completely like oblivious or heedless, but it's just how can I just keep uh, activating those uh, you know, like my, my spirituality in that in, in every moment. Yeah, and we're different people, right? So if the goal is for me to extend salams to people mm -hmm. I don't know, for some of us that could be very nerve-wracking, you know. And so the wakefulness part comes not in the end result being achieved. But being able to ask questions, like what's getting in the way for me 
from achieving my ops my goal right and every goal has obstacles between you and its acquisition and these are of two types internal and external and an external goal is you know I'm sorry I missed the halakha my flight got canceled you know on my way back from Chicago I didn't come to your wedding my train like you know broke down in the middle it's literally something that exists outside of me what we perceive quite often as external obstacles are actually internal obstacles right the fear the anxiety kind of the confusion anything else that our bodies now serve as a means of signs as what's going on within us you know why am i so irritable like why am i so exhausted why am i like so tired why am i this why am i that but fundamentally the goal like the wakefulness comes up in acknowledging what's really built up within me that's keeping me from doing some of these things do you know what's keeping me from actively like getting done the things that i'd like to get done and some of those are going to be easy some of those are going to be really tough to navigate but that's where it's like the process and you're on this kind of you know journey individually with the blessing of like people around you that can support you when you get tired and you need to take a break other thoughts we're taking away so we talked about like uh how, how we verbalize um muraqaba, right and how does that look for each person so for some of us it looks more like looking at the aqil looking at how we use our intellect to um to reflect on our current state and for others it's like it looks different right so um you know for some of us it, it looked like using the aqil and then for some of us it looked like using the heart um, and doing bigger right as a as a means of muraqaba so i think it's really interesting to just think about verbalizing muraqaba and vigilance yeah and a spiritual like secret that isn't really that secret but is necessary is a lot of this is going to also be found through moments of silence right because it's really easy to talk and then not do right and this is quran right that why do you say that which you don't do the default in our kind of spiritual tradition is silence that whosoever is habitually believing in Allah in the last day, let him speak good or be silent, right? Yasmut is like very key of a word because there's some narrations where it says yaskut instead of yasmut. Samt is essentially like you don't have the ability to talk in its most literal sense. And so it's saying unless you're going to speak good, then behave in such a way where you don't even have like the capacity to speak if you wanted to unless what's going to come out of your mouth is good, right? So it doesn't mean just speak good, but it also is emphasizing the need to not speak at all sometimes, to just listen and talk, right? In the sense that it's inward and you're just observing, you're paying attention, you're hearing things, and that can create like wakefulness, do you know? And you're like taking from like the environment around you. Do you see what I mean? You can't learn if you're not listening. And if you're the one that's talking all the time, then there's no way you're listening. You see what I'm saying, right? Does that make sense? So getting comfortable with a notebook, right? Reviving like the ability to actually take a pen and put it to paper and to put your thoughts there. It creates accountability because a month later you can go back and read what you wrote as opposed to just think about what you were doing through the prism of where you're at a month like that's past as opposed to channeling who you were a month before accurately the paper will now cause you to stay true to it you see what i mean does that make sense um you were going to say something um just some thoughts i'm not sure how to articulate into a question but you know like there's this whole concept of affirmations that we hear about a lot um, as helping our mental health in many ways and kind of combating negative energies and cynicism and being jaded, which happens sometimes more often as you're getting older, kind of see the glass half full or you lose trust or you lose faith in people or in situations or in, you know, whatever obstacles may come. So uh, I'm wondering how sort of, it's half empty. I'm wondering how sort of the concept of um, these, you know, reciting positive affirmations may kind of fit in to us recalibrating or trying to always come back to the center or to on the right path, you know, 
in this picture of like our, the state of our heart in Merakaba and um, like Arnia and all of these concepts. Like where, how can we use, or can we, positive affirmations? Is there a place for that to yeah. kind of tie in? That's what dhikr is, right? Fundamentally, the idea is to not just remember God in the sense that like God needs your remembrance, right? These are just fundamental theological points that have real truth to them. Allah does not need your prayer, like your prayer is given to you for you. Like your remembrance of God is not because God needs your remembrance for Him, but the remembrance is for you. So you drill down, like why is it for me? What's it really about? And if I don't know who God is, and then I sit down and I rattle off from my finger, SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, who am I glorifying? Who am I praising? Whose greatness am I proclaiming in these utterances? And they can become affirmations rooted in an understanding of first, like, who is Allah to me? What am I glorifying God for at the end of the day? And how does that then allow for me to recognize what is, like, glorious about me? Right? What am I praising Allah for? And if I know who Allah is, then within that, I'm also affirming what is uniquely special about me that God would give me this thing that I'm thanking Him for in the first place. Right? Do you understand what I'm saying? And those affirming thoughts become important both in terms of how we talk to ourselves and how we talk to each other. And there's not any instances that you can find in the hadith where the Prophet ﷺ is alone and Allah does not surround him with somebody that helps him. You know, so he gets his initial revelation and he thinks he's lost his mind. He has doubt. He believes like he's gone crazy. And he now is met very crucially with somebody who provides him with support. This is Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. He lets out all the anxiety, the stress, and she's there to do the affirming voice. You are a good man. You honor guests. You treat orphans with dignity and respect. You remember those that the world has forgotten, right? It's there. Who are the supportive voices around you? If the people around you constantly just point out criticism, or you constantly just point out criticism with people, right? It's going to start to chip away at their heart and your heart. You need people who are real with you, and they can be that affirming voice when you don't have it for yourself. The Prophet goes on Isra and Miraj. He comes back. It's a night journey. He goes from his home to the city of Jerusalem, ascends to the heavens, and comes back on the same night. And every Muslim like believes that this happened. And he's got to now tell people that this happened. And people start to make fun of him. The mushrikeen like mock him. Some Muslims start to doubt him. Some people even leave Islam. And when he's sitting there and they're like laughing at him and they're going to person after person, do you know what your prophet wants us to believe? He wants us to believe that he did this journey from Mecca to Jerusalem in a night that takes us like so much longer. And not only did he do that, but he was taken to the heavens and then came all the way back here all in one night. And when they say this to Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr says, if my friend said it, then it must be true. And then he goes and sits where the Prophet is speaking. And every so often, when the Prophet says something, he says, Sadaq, Sadaq, Sadaq. He has spoken the truth. He's spoken the truth. He's spoken the truth. What do you think it does for like his kind of just sense of self? You know, that he's in a place. And then just also just think about, though, how crazy it is that people trust the messenger so much that he literally flew on a winged horse and went across cities in a night and forget about the people for a minute who didn't believe him there were still people who believed him because he was that much of a trustworthy person and they believed in him that much right and that's like the legacy that we're supposed to follow you're supposed to be trustworthy when you're a muslim people are supposed to like believe you're going to keep your promises and that you're going to fulfill responsibilities and uphold amana and trust. That's like the legacy of the Messenger of God, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But in the context we're talking about, like he's not alone, right? There's somebody there. You got to have good friends. And you have to let yourself be comfortable in letting people support you. Which I don't know why this is a thing, but like 
very many of us don't like it when people do things for us, you know? And it's not even that they're holding things over us. It's okay for letting somebody do something for you. I went and did a wedding for my nephew and my first cousin's son. And my wife and kids were supposed to come. They all got sick. And so I went on my own and I then flew in and flew out so that I could come back to be here with my family. And my flight the day after the wedding ceremony was like really early after Fudger. And my cousin, her husband, really great guy, mashallah, he was running around on no sleep and he wanted to drive me to the airport. And so when I left from the wedding to get some sleep because of my early flight, my aunt came with me, who's elderly and she needs some rest. And she said, so what's your plan? And I said, I'm gonna leave tomorrow actually. And she said, oh, how are you getting to the airport? And I said, you know, Salman Bhai wanted to take me to the airport, but I feel bad that, you know, he's gonna wake up early, he's not getting so much rest and I can just take a Uber. And she said to me, Khalid, it's not gonna take anything away from you if you let somebody do something nice for you. And you know he wants to do it. You know it'll make him feel good if you let him do it. And you'll also feel good that somebody who loves you, you get to experience that they love you and that's why they're doing something for you. So he said, she said, why wouldn't you let somebody do this ihsan for you? What's it gonna really take away? If anything, it's just gonna add so much more. You can only build those relationships if you're willing to let people actually be there for you in certain ways. And to allow for yourself to reciprocate it where it's possible. The Prophet ﷺ goes to Taif, thinking people are going to welcome him in, and he gets thrown out by the chieftains, the tribes, leaders, have their children and servants run him out, to the extent that what he's wearing on his feet, some of the narrations say, are covered in blood and get stuck to the soles of his feet because the amount of abuse he sustains. Now he turns to God and says, have you forsaken me? And the angel of the mountains comes to the Prophet and says, if you command me to, I will crush these people. And the Prophet says, no, let them be. The generations that come after, they'll understand. But even when the Prophet doesn't have anybody else, like an angel comes to say, you're not in this alone, right? A spiritual journey that has a common destination but distinct entry points does not mean that you traverse without companionship. And understanding this in the terms of committed relationships, in terms of friendships, in terms of family, everybody doesn't always have what the rest of us have. Some of us have to stop playing games in the relationship kind of arena where a society that teaches you to constantly be dissatisfied with what you have and then you keep pushing away real viable partners that could be good for you in this world and in the next that then at times when you're alone it's just not going to feel right right but also in terms of friends don't just hang out with the people that you're supposed to that come from same culture same race same class but people are going to be good for your heart right people whose hearts you know are going to be thoughtful of your heart and they're going to want to spend time with you right you all come and sit here many of you every monday sometimes there's a little less people sometimes there's twice as many most of you don't interact with the rest of you outside of this space. I went to a masjid in Boston the other day and gave Juma there and then spoke at a dars in the evening. Two people took their shahada in front of me, like in like the few hours that I was there. And there was a young man who had taken his shahada previously who sent me a long email and he said, this is the first time I've ever felt like somebody actually spoke to me before in this masjid that I've been in. And all I did in their halakha was kind of similar to what I did here. I didn't do it as often, but at the end, I had them just talk to each other. And some of these people prayed together for years and had never spoken to each other before and didn't learn anything about each other. How can you support somebody if you don't even know their name? And how can your prayer be deep if your heart is not really in unison because you have love for the persons that are sitting next to you, right? And right behind you might be like your best friend of all time. You just don't know because you're hanging out with the people you're supposed to hang out with, right? You interact with the people that you are supposed to interact with, the ones that you can never bring home because what would my parents say if I was friends with this person or that person? Same foolish notion about like people not letting their kids marry people of different cultures 
or different races or different classes, like you limit yourself from those who can be supporters. And then when those people aren't around, like you do have positive self-talk. Shaitan's whispers come to your heart. He doesn't control your thoughts, but can get you to a place where you believe success is rooted in things that actually don't make you successful. And you can start to now see yourself for who you actually are by giving yourself these affirming thoughts. And when you can be in a place where your mental strength is rooted in that, you can achieve things that you couldn't ever think were actually possible because it's like an inward strength that comes in, right? And not like in a narcissistic way where you stand in front of a mirror and you say, I'm the most beautiful man ever created. And, you know, it's people's blessings that they get to see me when I walk down the street, right? That's just weird. Don't do that, right? But not in a delusional sense, in a sense that's real. That people have told you all your life that there's something wrong with you, you start to break down that inner voice by giving yourself affirming conversation. In the Muraqaba states, you're contemplating on things particularly that are not just rooted in kind of saying like the adhkar that we're given, but also deepening for yourself with an opportunity reflection that starts to shift your inner state to a place that there's more positive self-talk, not negative self-talk. Do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? And then the end result is decisions become reflective of what's in your heart. I've used this example before where my kids, we went and there was like free ice cream being given and there was a huge line. And one of my kids, said, I want the ice cream. The other kid said, I want the ice cream. I said, great, get in line. And the other kid said, Baba, you get in line. I said, I'm not getting in line for your ice cream. You get in line. And one of my kids decided to stand in line and the other decided to not stand in the line. And then one of them got ice cream and then the other did not get the ice cream. And all one of them saw was the line and the other saw the ice cream. Do you understand? And that's a product of how they see it inwardly. And then the one kid who got the ice cream, because he sees a little bit differently, he then gave that ice cream to the other kid. Do you see? And then they both ended up getting some ice cream. By the <laughs> but you get the point of the story, right? You don't want to miss out on it because all you see is the line. But you don't also want to hate yourself because you see the line. That's not gonna work. You want to then ask yourself, why do I only see the line? Why am I not seeing what's at the end of the line? Do you get what I mean? Does that make sense? Okay. <laughs>